My name is Sahan Insafi, and I'm a Canadian physician assistant working in emergency medicine. So today we're interviewing Sahand Insafi, who is a Canadian physician assistant working in emergency medicine in downtown Toronto. Welcome, Sahand. Thanks, Anne. It's great to be here. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got into the PA profession? Or what, yeah, what made you uh, decide to... Absolutely. Um, I think a lot of our Canadian colleagues probably share a similar um, viewpoint in, in that because it's so new in Canada, a lot of us kind of just stumbled upon the profession, mm -hmm. uh, which is similar to what happened to me. Uh, I went to the University of Waterloo for my undergraduate degree. I was doing life sciences there. Uh, and during my time there, I, I always had a, a, the belief that I was going to do pharmacy. Uh, however, after volunteering in a few pharmacies and you know reassessing what I wanted in, in my future and in my career, I decided that pharmacy probably wasn't the right fit for, for me. Uh, and so I started kind of researching other healthcare professions. Medicine was something that was never very appealing to me in that I'm someone who's much more practical. I like to get out and work and uh, learn kind of on the job as, as opposed to getting formalized training uh, through schooling. Uh, you know, the idea of being in school for, in, in a formal school or education process uh, for, you know, somewhere onwards of 10 to 12 to 15 years, depending on what you want to do when you go into medicine, was something that did not appeal to me whatsoever. Uh, and so I kind of knew that medicine wasn't an option. I started to scramble and, and look for jobs that would kind of allow me to practice medicine, but, you know, allowed me to bypass, in a way, all of that schooling. And so I actually stumbled upon PAs in the U.S. There was a Forbes article talking about physician assistants. It rated them as being the number one job uh, in the U.S. And so I thought, you know, what the heck is a PA? I've never heard of this before. I actually, you know, thought of the name and I said, well, physician assistant like they're doing probably clerical stuff for the doctor like how is this the best job in the United States and when I actually researched it I saw in fact the, the name is almost a misnomer in that you know you're not doing a lot of clerical work or typical tasks that an assistant might be doing uh, but more so you are a physician extender where you practice medicine you see diagnose treat illness uh, you can prescribe medications, you can help in surgeries and perform procedures yourself. Uh, and so I kind of fell in love with it. And I quickly did a Google search shortly after uh, stumbling into the profession and I ran into the McMaster PA program opening their the first PA or one of the first PA programs in Canada. And so I uh, fell in love and I applied and fortunately I, I got in. Um, how did you uh, decide where to work after school? Um, once you were done PA school, you ended up in emergency medicine. So how did how did you make that transition? Yeah, I uh, I kind of went into the program with a very open mind. I always knew that I I enjoyed emergency medicine, the fast paced environment, uh, you know, the chaos. I'm someone who kind of enjoys working in those kinds of environments, and I and I find uh, a lot of uh, fulfillment in working in that setting. Uh, however, I I went into the program thinking I'm going to keep my mind open. I'm not going to you know. Uh, go into it thinking that I'm going to come out practicing in a certain field. Mm -hmm. And so throughout my clerkship year, I did a lot of rotations in general surgery, family medicine, emergency medicine, uh, and that's really when I realized that emergency medicine was the, the rotation that I was the most excited about and the most excited to, to go to work and uh, you know learn and to get exposure to that field was something that I really enjoyed. I did all of my elective rotations, so the rotations where you know, we get to choose what we get, uh, what we get exposure to. Uh, I did in emergency medicine as well, so mm -hmm. that was kind of through that on the job training uh, in the second year of the PA program is when I got the sense that emergency medicine was probably the right thing for me. Although I should say that I was also still open to other careers, so I, I knew that a career in family medicine was definitely a, uh, a potential for me. Uh, a career in, in, in internal medicine was something that I was also open to. Uh, but what I would say is that I, I like uh, personally roles where you're more of a generalist. So general internal medicine when you're dealing with more broad issues, same with emergency medicine, you're kind of a guy that knows the trick of the trades, right? You, you, you're kind of ready for anything that comes in the door. That's what I really enjoy. Same thing with family medicine in that you're dealing with very common day-to-day -day ailments uh, and, and that's what I really wanted to get uh, comfortable in doing early on in my career. Okay, so what are some common conditions that you come across uh, if you're working in an eMERGE shift? 
you know, it's interesting. So what you realize in emergency medicine is that a lot of the time you actually don't diagnose a lot of common illnesses. And, mm -hmm. and what I mean by that is that uh, I think it's easier if we actually break it down by what are the common complaints that I see in emergency okay, medicine. So what are the common so, complaints? So the common complaints that we see are uh, things like chest pain, shortness of breath, um, abdominal pain. We see a tremendous amount of musculoskeletal complaints. So broken bones, sprains, strains of any part of the body. Uh, we see a variety in the center that I work at of neurological complaints because we're a neuro center. Uh, so we see things like strokes, we see brain tumors, bleeds in the brain, uh, things along those lines. And obviously in keeping with those complaints, we can sometimes make diagnoses. So someone may have chest pain and we might diagnose them as having something like a heart attack or a myocardial infarction. We might diagnose a pulmonary embolism, but a lot of the times we may not actually find the answer for them. Uh, and may not be able to tell them what the cause of their chest pain is and in fact we just say you know what we're able to tell you is in fact what the cause is not and so we'll tell them you're not having a heart attack you're not having a pulmonary embolism you're not having an infection in the heart that could be life-threatening uh, you're safe to go home so a lot of the times we may not have the actual diagnosis for the patient so it's a lot about ruling out a lot of the red flags um, for your patients yeah, exactly. That, that's what we do. That is the bread and butter of emergency medicine, I think, anywhere in the world, is, yeah. is ruling out the bad stuff. Uh, the minute I walk into a room and I see a patient, that is what I am doing with any of their complaints. If they have a musculoskeletal complaint, if they have a cardiac complaint, if they have a, a, you know, a pulmonary complaint, my job is to rule out the bad, life-threatening things. Mm -hmm. And as long as I can do that with a high degree of certainty and be comfortable to send you home, uh, that is our job. Unfortunately, I think for some patients that's, and also for us as clinicians, is not always very satisfying because a lot of people have a lot of expectations in medicine uh, and they come to the emergency department thinking that we have all of the answers right. and there can be a lot of frustration in hearing, you know, we don't know what your pain is and, and patients often ask us, well, you know, it's great I'm not having a heart attack, but I have this pain. What's my pain? Uh, and so sometimes we, we, we don't know, but it's about ruling out the bad, life-threatening stuff. Okay. Um, so do you mind describing the structure of the emergency department? Uh, one, I know you work in several emergency departments uh, in terms of the different zones, and where do PAs fall uh, in terms of where they, where they work during a shift? Yeah, so it, it also depends on, I think, where, where you're working. The beauty of being a PA and the beauty of being a PA in Emerge or in any setting really is that the, the physicians that you're working with and, and your colleagues can cater uh, what you're capable of doing to what the needs of the department are. Uh, so in certain hospitals, uh, the PA may be really functioning in their fast track or rapid assessment zones where you get a lot of the bread and butter uh, every day, you know, bumps, bruises, scrapes, fractures, maybe the lower risk chest pains, the lower risk abdominal pains. Uh, and the reason why they function in those areas is number one, a lot of those areas require procedures to be done that can often be time consuming. So it's nice to have a PA there to do those procedures. For example, splinting, suturing, reducing or setting broken bones, and you know, also doing incisions for infected wounds and allowing the pus to come out, which are called abscesses. Um, so, so those areas, are, I guess, kind of get a lot of bang for their buck with the work that the PA does. Um, however, in, in other hospitals and in the areas where, where I work, the PAs, a lot of the time, will just go to the areas of the department that have the highest wait times and the highest volume of patients on that particular shift. So in our, in our area, we do have a rapid assessment zone in one of the hospitals that is seeing about 80% of the volume of patients that go through. It's not truly a rapid assessment area in that we see um, numerous uh, patients with chest pains, abdominal pains that actually end up being you know, appendicitis, appendicitis or a surgical complication uh, or or it ends up leading to a diagnosis that requires surgical intervention. Mm -hmm. um, and so the PAs often will function in that area. However, on our acute side or on our subacute sides where we typically uh, keep patients where we think when they come in or when they're being triaged, the nurses believe they're automatically, based on their complaint, just a higher risk patient. If those areas are busier, we will go to those areas and also help in seeing patients in those areas. So it's not to say that as a PA, you can only deal with minor complaints and bumps and, and, and scrapes and bruises. 
that's usually where the, the a lot of the volume is, and so that's where PAs are often utilized. We also have the skills to deal with more complicated patients as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and if the need is in those areas, then we will go to those areas and help out as well. Cool. So what I often tell people who are well-versed in the medical system is that a PA, a well-trained PA will function similar to a senior resident or a fellow of that service. So uh, what I will do oftentimes is I will manage the patient essentially up to the point of discharge and when the patient is ready to be discharged is once I will get the physician involved unless it's a case that I'm not familiar with uh, or something a little bit more complicated where I might need assistance earlier on uh, after I've assessed the patient. Uh, in those settings I may review it a bit sooner but mm -hmm. for I would say 80 to 90 percent of the cases I see now in the eMERGE I'll, I'll typically manage the patient from start to finish and at the time of discharge review the case uh, at which point we'll go and discharge the patient together with the with the physician who's on. What differences has the emergency department noticed since adding PAs um, to their service? Um, I, I think the most uh, obvious uh, difference or, or change that people have noticed is improved access to care and that uh, length times have been or length of stays have been reduced for patients. So whenever we have PAs or NPs or advanced practice providers as a whole group on to help with our physicians in assessing patients and treating patients, what we find is that our wait times are significantly reduced. So on days where we're fully staffed with our PAs and NPs in our departments, uh, our wait times can be sometimes only about an hour or so uh, for even less complicated or severe severe issues that oftentimes in more rural settings or in settings where PAs and NPs are not present might be waiting for hours and hours on end to be seen. Um, the other uh, thing that I, I personally believe is that PAs can also improve quality of care. Uh, when you have multiple clinicians who are on, you have less stress on the actual physician in terms of feeling that they need to see everybody in the department independently. Mm -hmm. That way the physician can take more time with the patients that they're seeing. The PA, we know PAs and MPs all will take a little bit more time with the patients uh, with the interactions that they have with patients. And so in a sense, I would hope that with spending more time, there's less chances of us making errors, missing diagnoses, making incorrect diagnoses, uh, and ultimately improving the, the care that the patient receives. Fantastic. Um, so it sounds like you've had a tremendous impact on the emergency department uh, in Toronto along with the other PAs that are working on that service. We definitely try. Okay, fantastic. Um, so my last question for you is, uh, do you have any tips uh, or advice for anyone who is interested in uh, becoming a PA in Canada? Research the profession. Um, I think a lot of people look at the profession as a stepping stone to a medical program. Uh, and I would say that it's not in any way this. Uh, I think PAs are uh, experienced and very well-educated clinicians that have a specific role to fill in our healthcare system by helping improve access to care. Uh, I think it's always troubling when we get students who try to use the PA program as a stepping stone or feel or think from what they've heard from others that this is a stepping stone to becoming a physician. Uh, so my biggest thing is research the role, make sure that you're, this is exactly what you want to do because if you want to be a doctor, you should go and be a doctor. Even though there's a lot of similarities between the roles, uh, PAs and physicians are, are different professions. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that I would say is with, with the research you want to ensure that you're up to speed with the minimum requirements for the programs, make sure you're meeting the minimum requirements and get as much volunteer experience as you can. In Canada it's a little bit difficult to find somebody you can shadow but there's definitely a list of PAs who you can try to get in contact with to provide you with advice about their careers, to hopefully answer any of your questions uh, and that's the best way I think uh, for people to find out whether or not this career is right for them and, and that's how I found out that it was right for me was was through volunteering I realized that pharmacy wasn't right for me and uh, after doing you know weeks and weeks of research into the into the programs what the outlooks for the career is as well as um, what it takes to actually go through the programs is when I realized that this was exactly what I wanted to do. So thank you for watching another episode on the Canadian PA YouTube channel. Thank you Sahan for coming on. It was a pleasure having you on. It's a pleasure being on. So don't forget to like, subscribe and comment uh, below. Uh, we have some useful links and some show notes in the description box. Which you below. Can find below. Great. So that's a wrap.